Companies obviously have huge environmental impact and the very rich 1% have more impact than more than half the population. So we need to think about who these people are and who we should really be targeting when we talk about individual action. Hello and welcome to the King's Business School Connections podcast. My name is Hannah Schupfer and I'm a research associate here at King's College London at the Center for Sustainable Business. And I'm very delighted to be joined here today by Thomas Panton to join us in conversation about the topic of sustainable consumption. Thomas is a leading expert in this topic. He has over time founded three startups on circular economy and uh, has spent several years in the area of climate action. He's also a guest lecturer and speaker on several climate tech events and uh, leading universities such as UCL. So welcome, Thomas. It's really nice to have you here. Hi, Anna. Maybe for the beginning, do you want to Tell us a little about what made you passionate for sustainable consumption and a little bit about your background. Yeah, for sure. Th thanks so much for the for the introduction. I feel like you are praising me and I'm just sat here taking it all in. It, it, I mean, it all started um, quite a long time ago. So I actually was originally in my during my teenage years an international swimmer and hadn't really planned on doing anything else. And then I got injured and had to sort of radically shift any plans that I had to, to go forward. And all my friends had gone off to university and I was like, well, I haven't planned to go to university, so I'm just going to work for a year and work out what I want to do. For me, I ended up being a tailor in a jean shop and you just instantly get sort of well-versed in the amount of fashion waste, the amount of clothes which are, you know, unrepairable or just aren't, people aren't doing it. They're just chucking them away and buying new pairs. And it was my first sort of baptism of fire into how bad the fast fashion industry is. Even though I'd grown up around that knowledge base, it wasn't something that I had um, necessarily been deeply involved in until that point. So that sort of defined what I wanted to do, I think. I wanted to be involved in that top level of where are these problems coming from? How can we solve them? And that sort of led me down the route originally of sort of politics and human rights and international relations just to understand the different relationships between different organizations. But as soon as I got to university to do that, I came across someone who was working at Greenpeace, being the largest independent environmental organization in the world. And I was just instantly hooked. I love the work that they're doing. I knew about them already, but, you know, meeting someone who was working there and hearing about brilliant sort of campaigns they were running, but even just all the way down to their foot soldier fundraisers who knew so much and were doing that legwork to get people backing them as an organization. It just really impassioned me. So I spent the better half of a decade working there and working everything from fundraiser to outreach events and then on some activism and campaigns as well. And it just teaches you It, you know, it's quite depressing in a lot of ways because you realize how many issues there are, but also it's incredibly hopeful in the sense that you see how many people want to change that. My one challenge with it all was just how slowly these big corporations move. We're campaigning against companies like Coca-Cola or Santander and HSBC and even governments. And just there's a lot of red tape, a lot of bureaucracy, and it takes a long time to get that work over the line. And Greenpeace are doing an amazing job of doing that. But for me, I needed a bit more fast pace. And so the reason I left was to essentially just go and get my hands dirty and start my own projects to try and solve problems on the ground that I was seeing and experiencing. And as you say, that led to me being a startup founder and following an academic career as well. So going down into more niche, like ethical consumerism and, and how sort of climate engagement with individuals and their responses to that, what the barriers for them to get involved. And that's sort of defining the career that I lead now. That's super interesting. And as the topic is sustainable consumption today and the yeah. role of the consumers, what is your opinion? What is the kind of impact that a consumer can actually have? And where is the responsibility of the consumer? It's such a important question because for decades we've been told that it's our responsibility it's the individuals you know oil companies came up with the term carbon footprint and it was to really put that responsibility back on the individual to to take ownership over how they were consuming in lots of different work, walks of life whether that's food fashion energy you know whatever it is i think that you know the answer is multifaceted as a simple response it's a relationship between all of those organizations from the individual to the ngo to the government to the business 
startups and to the startups that are innovating to try and solve some of those corporate problems at the top. But I think there is so much power in our wallet as individuals. So I think that often it's less about what we're specifically consuming and the impact that that has and more about the decisions we make to change things when we can. And, and I think it's really important that last bit, when we can, because for a lot of people, they're just not in a position to change their lifestyle radically. We all need to be understanding of, you know, there's been far too much judgment in the climate movement over the last 50 years of people who don't make change, but, you know, less understanding of why they don't make change. That if we're going to bring more people into the climate movement, and particularly around consumption, whether that is with products we're buying or food we're consuming or, you know, whatever, I think we need to have the conversation of how does that relate to each individual and, and how's that going to benefit or impact their lives both positively or negatively. I, I think one thing that people forget is that companies obviously have huge environmental impact and the very rich 1% have more impact than more than half the population. So we need to think about who these people are and who we should really be targeting when we talk about individual action. But we also need to think about the fact that companies and governments are run by people. So when we talk about individual responsibility, but it is still individual responsibility. They are the decision makers. They are the people who can make choices. It's just about us using our collective power to pressure them to make the right one. Yeah, I think it's yeah super interesting what you're saying. Also, the fact that it doesn't necessarily have to take a radical transformation of your whole life as an individual in order to show commitment to, to climate action. In your opinion, what are the kind of low-hanging fruits that an individual can adapt in its daily behavior to consume more sustainable? I think there are lots of things that we can do, which we've been told over many years. And they are things which feel very minuscule as an individual, but when billions of people do them, they, they have huge impact. And that's everything from, you know, energy, how we conserve energy by turning off lights and various other things, what we do with food waste and, and those different things. But I think there are some more actionable things that we're seeing in the modern era, which require a little bit more thought, but once you've made the action, they're going to have a huge impact on your own life, but also as a collective of people, uh, a huge environmental impact. So a great example is if you can consider the investment into a reusable water bottle, which seems like a lot of money compared to a single use plastic bottle, right? Like you can buy one for one pound 50 in the shop, but a reusable water bottle, you're talking you know, 20, 30 pounds sometimes. But I think that what we need to talk about is that long-term impact that that has. If you buy a reusable water bottle, you're not ever going to need to buy a single-use plastic bottle again. And the money that you save doing that, you will see over and over again as, a, as an investment and actually a return on capital. You're spending less over a longer period of time. And similarly, then the impact of that. One reusable water bottle, yes, has more impact than one single-use plastic bottle. But the number of single-use plastic bottles that you replace by using that reusable water bottle then has a monumental environmental impact. So, so there's all of these like tiny things. I, I think one of the big wide points that can be made there is look at the things which are circular, look at the things which are refillable, reusable, replaceable, rather than always new. You know, a virgin product is always going to be more impactful than something which is being used, replaced or redefined as a product. So I think there's lots of examples of that. Wild Cosmetics refillable deodorant, there's Ocean Saver refillable cleaning products. Um, there's Ithosa refillable uh, shampoo and you know, there's all these great brands and products which are creating and innovating these brilliant products that allow us to not only have a really great environmental impact, but also save money over time. So I think that we need to start reimagining the way we consume products as individuals. But I, again, I do just come back to the fact that to see that on scale, it relies on innovation from companies and a commitment from companies to present these as affordable alternatives to the individual. Uh, and that reply relies on the government bringing in incentives to facilitate that. I hear a lot of pushback in our industry about, yeah, but some people just can't afford a reusable water bottle. They're living paycheck to paycheck. It's not something that they can actually invest in, even though it might seem like a, like a, a good investment. The actual realistic scenario for a lot of people on the sort of lower end of that ladder is just not really reasonable. So that's when you need, and this is a very small scale, but we see this with transport and energy. We need that incentives, both financially and policy-wise from government, which brings those prices down for the consumer. So you get mass consumption, then it becomes a business case and economically viable for businesses. And then the individuals are having a positive impact. Actually, you just answered already a little bit my next question. 
is sustainable consumption necessarily more expensive than conventional products? Because very often you you hear, oh yeah, all these mm. fancy organic brands are very nice, but they're simply just too expensive to consume them with daily behavior. Yeah, I, I think that it's a totally justified point to make and one which is still pr predominantly true. Once you start thinking longer term about the, the money you make back by reselling or reusing, that takes a different stance on that. What I would say is that we've seen a huge change and shift over the last sort of, 20 years, whereby 20 years ago, you could get two types of eco-friendly products and they would either be cheap, but they would be rubbish quality. So actually you'd end up buying them again and again and again anyway. So actually you're almost not having a more positive impact or they'd just be ridiculously expensive and they'd very much be luxury goods for a very specific niche of audience who could afford that. And over time, what we've seen is that the, th those products still exist, but you're getting that middle ground now of sort of like daily consumer products, which are becoming more affordable to your working and middle-class families. They are impactful, but they are not sort of these luxury price points or luxury goods. What I really love about a lot of these products is that they are still brilliant quality. When we talk about better products or sustainable products, they're better in not just the environmental impact, but they're better in so many other ways. They're better in the way that they've been produced. They're better in the way that they've considered human rights and supply chain. So there's so many like multifaceted layers of how much better this product is and what you're investing in as a consumer. But I think there's still work to be done to answer the question shortly. What we really need to see are mainstream brands, which aren't going to go anywhere, right? You know, there's this big like assumption in the world that these sustainable brands are going to replace these huge brands. Well, it's not going to happen. What's going to happen is these big brands are eventually going to innovate and come into the market as well. And they'll start buying up all of these smaller brands so that they can bring them into their portfolio of companies. Uh, and that's what we need to start seeing now. And we are beginning to see, but it, but it's very much the beginning of that. Yeah, super interesting. Talking about these sustainable products or maybe even talking about the more dominating brands that we as a consumers, we can see a lot of different sustainable certificates being mm. organic, biological, recycled plastic. Yeah. How do I, as a consumer, know whether this is valid? This is a age old question, right? Mm. Am I being told the truth? Is this actually good? And, and I think that for a lot of time and, and, a, and a lot of work within that, it's been good intention, but the actual impact has not been as positive as the intention. So you've seen a lot of brands create products claiming certain things, but not really having evidence of that in their supply chain. And, and a, a lot of the time we can see that really simply with products like that are claiming to be cruelty free, but never been certified. Cruelty free is more than just testing on animals. It's where that product has come from, the impact that's had on the biodiversity around it. And that's why you have certifications to, to check on these sorts of ingredients and, and materials that, pr that brands are using. So the first point of call is, are they certified? Are, are they actually verified by a reputable organization, which has done this and has that reputation of making sure that this has been verified and vetted for its work. But then you've got to talk about the convenience of doing that. It's not convenient for us as an individual to have to research every single product that we want to buy. So I think that it's about bringing those into one place where you can learn, um, but you can also consume at the same time. So Canopy does it, but there are other platforms which essentially are vetting those claims all in one platform for you. So as a consumer, you don't then have to have multiple different tabs looking at all of these different certifications, all of these different products, but actually you can just go to one place and you can check that this has got certifications. You can see the stamp of approval and then you can purchase based on your values. A lot of these places are making that hyper-personalized. So it's going, oh, you really care about vegan products? Well, you can search just for vegan products or whatever that certification is so that it really resonates with the individual rather than this wider impact conversation. Where we're moving to now is convenience tied into the verification movement. I think we have a long way to go because verifications and certifications are generally quite expensive for small companies. So you get all of these amazing impactful small businesses, which can't afford to be certified. So therefore don't show up on these platforms. And then you've this lost 
lost business. So I think we need to see work in the certification and verification market to make this more price accessible for small businesses and time accessible, because often they take a lot of time to verify. So if we can start to see innovation in that space, then it's going to make it easier for the consumer as well. But right. right now, the best thing that a consumer do is look for the certifications um, or use a platform which is bringing them all into one place for you. Do you want to tell our listeners uh, the name of the company? Because I think that's, uh, yeah, exactly what is needed. <laughs> Yeah, the, my company is called Canopy, so C-A-N-O-P-E-Y, and it's just canopy.com. Essentially, Canopy is a marketplace platform which streamlines that journey for an individual. So you can learn, shop, and track your impact, and then get rewarded for that journey so that you keep coming back and refill your products, etc. So this is something that we spent quite a lot of time innovating on to build the tech in the background. So it's as easy for the individual as possible. And we do all the hard work for you. <laughs> and this is really important because it's talking about that convenience piece versus the sustainability piece. If you're asking people to just care about values, but lose the convenience, you're not going to get much uptake. But if you can give them both in one place, then it's much more likely to be attractive to people. So yeah, check it out by all means. If it makes your life easier, then, then I'm glad we've done our job. Definitely agree. Brilliant. Okay. So having all your, your expertise from the recent years, how or what do you think does the future look like for sustainable consumption? I think it's incredibly positive as like a starting statement. I think that we're starting to see government policy coming in, which is going to be regulating the types of materials and ingredients and goods that we can use. We're seeing that a lot in the EU. And a good example of that is we recently had this big hoo-ha about the fact that some cartons of juice or bottles have attached lids. And the reason for this was that it's much better to recycle them. These are the sort of policies uh, we need to start seeing more of. We're definitely seeing them come in, um, trickling down quicker and quicker. But I think that we're still very much at the beginning of the, the, the question that's always on, on our minds in the is the regulation coming quick enough for the severity of the situation we're in? As an example, you know, in 2021, Amazon uh, produced and generated an estimated 315,000 tons of plastic packaging waste. Um, and there's been multiple reports to show that they're discarding hundreds of thousands of products straight into landfill. If It's cheaper for them to do that than to process returns and exchanges. And they just discard the product and send a new one out. Uh, and if these sorts of things aren't regulated, then you've got these huge behemoth companies, which are just going to continue because it's affordable for them to do it. They can deal with the fines they get for greenwashing. They can continue to say that they're doing great work and never really change anything enough. So I think from a from the startup perspective and then also the academic and the government policy, like there's a frustration from, from us as individuals because we really need the, these bigger companies being punished is too hard of a word, but but definitely regulated to make sure that they are also doing their work. But it's all very well and good startups innovating. So I think, yeah, as an overall statement, it's positive. I think we're moving very much in the right direction. It's still great to have some kind of a positive outlook yeah. because times it can be a little bit hard yeah. to stay optimistic. We can talk about company responsibility, government responsibility, individual responsibility, but fundamentally... Mm -hmm. All of those are full of individuals. So yes, we all have different amounts of impact and different amounts of power to change things, but ultimately we can all have a, a part to play in that journey of making positive change. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for all your insights. And yeah, for those who are more interested in Thomas's work, check out his website and check out Canopay if uh, you want more assistance in sustainable consumption. Thank you so much. Thanks also for the great work that you're doing and for staying optimistic. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Connections. Subscribe for more insights into the issues shaping business, the economy and society.